Stop with the new market. One hundred and eighty. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Weekly Darts Cast, sponsored by Dart Wolf. I'm Alex Moss. Yes, I'm back. Delighted to once again be alongside the Dart Statistician, Burton Dewitt. How are you doing? Well, can't say that the U.S.'s struggles in cricket are that surprising, but I think like you, when it comes to cricket, I've been happier than I am right now. But other than that, doing really well. It is the 4th of July here. Uh, How are you, Alex? I'm doing all right, thank you. First of all, um, just wanted to say shout out to our producer, Hannah, for stepping in for me last week. As some of you will know, I've been moving my internet at my new place. didn't go live until this week, so that's why I couldn't make last week's show. But I'm pleased to be back after my week off. Lots to get to. We've got two guests coming on the show. We're going to be joined by Peter McCormick from Shot Darts. Looking forward to that chat to get more of an insight into the, the news from the weekend. Michael Smith signing with Shot Darts, his new manufacturer, plus... The field is confirmed. The draw is now out and we'll be starting our preview towards the world match play, which starts a week on Saturday. We're going to be joined by one of the two debutants in the field for this year. Mike Decker is going to be stopping by. But before all of that, let's start with a look back at the weekend, the European darts match play. And wow, what a dramatic finish to what was in terms of overall standard, a top class event. Luke Humphreys surviving match darts in the final to beat Dirk van Dijvenboda 8-7. It's uh, a fifth career Euro Tour title for Cool Hand. He'd been in four Euro Tour finals this year, lost all four, but it was fifth time lucky to get that fifth title. But with the match play now on the horizon, is this the time for Cool Hand to win that first major title? I think there's a every chance that it is. But you know, we've also been saying that for some time now, you know, over the last couple of years, especially the last year and a half. But even, you know, going back since his first UK Open final uh, a little over two, two and a half years ago now, uh, we've been saying it at a lot of these tournaments because, well, he's not number five or number six, rather, in the world by fluke. He's not a five time winner, only the sixth player to do that by fluke. He's not made half of the final, more than half of the finals on the Euro Tour over that he's the ones he's competed in over the last two years by fluke. It's because he is a brilliant player and still getting better. You know, he won four of these last year, but I don't think he ever in any of those was impressive as he was up until the final in this one. First round, um, or sorry, second round, his first match, he only averaged 97, uh, but he wasn't really pushed in that match one at 6-1. After that, 109, 109 and a half. 105 and a half in the quarters, sorry, in the last 16 quarters and semifinals. In his first four matches, 58.1% on the double. That is not just world class. That is just brilliant. Yes, he regressed in the final. And as he said about six times in the interview, it just ran out of steam and it looked like both of them did. And that's, you know, acceptable and understandable. One, it's been a long night. Two, he was in the bottom half of the draw. So he was playing, he had played in three of the last four matches. His quarterfinal was the last quarterfinal. Then he was off for the semifinal, first semifinal, played the second semifinal and the final. So he had just played three matches in the span of an hour and a half, two hours. It's understandable that he did run out of steam in that final and managed to get over the line, got a little lucky in getting over the line, which we'll come to in the next question um, when we talk about uh, Dirk van Dijvenboda. But up until then, he was as dominant as we've seen anyone be on the European tour. It's not a surprise. He's now been to the final four of the last five Euro Tour events uh, over the past uh, two and a half months. He's done everything on the big stage on the European Tour. And now the question is, when will he make that next step in a major? He's gotten closer. At the end of last year, he made the semifinals. Um, in Wolverhampton, he made the semifinals in Minehead before playing himself out of the Premier League with an early exit in the World Championship, an early exit in some World Series events and a early exit, his first match in the Masters. But he's only better now than he was then. And entering the World Championship, entering the Masters, entering the UK Open, he was considered undeniably the best player who had yet to win a major. There are other people in that conversation. And there are players 
who've done pretty well this year on the European tour in that conversation. Dirk van Dijvenboda, for instance, making a pair of Euro Tour finals this year, having made two major finals as well over the last few years. Dave Chisnell having won two Euro Tours this year. But Luke Humphreys is the highest ranked player in ever to win a major currently. And I think unquestionably the best. And this weekend um, in Tier helped prove that. Is this his time? We'll see. He's got to come in confident. He's got to come in with belief. And that can only help him. He also has a relatively favorable first round draw, which will help get some of those nerves out of the way. Jose de Sousa, he is playing better than he was earlier in the year and late last year, but he's not playing at the level he was a couple years ago when he won his major, when he was a Premier League player, when he was a contender week in, week out, when he was leading the entire tour in the Players' Championship events and averages and throwing in 103s and 104s for fun. He's not playing at that level right now. Luke Humphreys is. He is in the best position going into a major, I think, that he has ever been in because he has that little bit of additional experience at the back end of majors that he didn't have when he was on this run last year. And I think he's also just improved his consistency in a game a little bit more. Five Euro Tour finals already this year from eight events that he's competed in four from the last five. That is brilliant. It's can he take the next step? I don't know if he will. We'll talk about that over the next couple of weeks. But is it his time? I think it I mean, I think it is his time. It's just will he actually go and do it? Hard to argue against any of that. Luke Humphreys, he's a name that for a couple of years now has been in the mix when these major tournaments have come around and we've been looking ahead to them. Other people have been giving their predictions on how they're going to play out. Many have, have backed him to, to win these majors. I think it was the match play, I want to say two years ago, his debut 2021. I was predicting there was going to be another debut winner following on from Dimitri Vandenberg in, in 2020. That didn't quite pan out in the end, but Just looking at the odds for this world match play coming up, it's not often that we can point to a a title sponsor for a darts tournament these days, but Betfred are the sponsors for the world match play. Luke Humphreys, before the draw was made, I think he's still around the same odds, 14 to 1 to win the tournament. And that's the best of the rest. You've got Michael Smith was the the favourite, 4 to 1. Then you've got Gerwin Price, Michael Van Gerwen at at 9 to 2. So, even the, the bookmakers themselves are saying that Luke Humphreys, if it's not going to be one of those, I don't know if we want to call it a big three in darts, if it's not one of those three, then the next most likely to do it is Luke Humphreys. And fair to say that he's playing well enough. And so I was having a look through the stats on darts Oracle before we started and looking at, I wanted to look at a, not a, a big size of, of data looking at the whole of this year, but I wanted to go back to the last three months and, from the end of April, so the Dutch Darts Championship, which Dave Chisnell beat Luke Humphreys in the final of that one from then to this past weekend. So a, a fair amount there. And looking at the averages, going price, as you'd imagine, is top 99.40. Then you've got Luke Humphreys, 98.77. And if you take out Jian Van Veen's development tour results, which are included in that, then Jian, he'd be second, 98.89. And after the weekend that he just had, definitely deserves a mention for how well he played getting to another quarterfinal. But in terms of Luke, right in the mix there in how well players are playing at the moment. 180s as well, just looking at the PDC senior tour, Luke Humphreys is top of that, top of the 140s, the, the checkout percentage, the metric for that, the last three months. Andrew Gilding is top of that, 45.93%. Then you've got Mike Decker, one of our guests on the show, 45.29%. Michael Smith, just under 44%. And Luke Humphreys, fourth on that list on 42%. So all three of those stats there, the averages, the the 180s, the 140s, the, the checkouts, Luke Humphreys is top or near to the top of those lists. So if, if you're high on all those stats, you're going to give yourself a, a good chance. And you mentioned how he played at the weekend as well. Some of those averages, OK, was a, a little bit lucky in the final. He said it himself to survive those match darts. And you look at the average in the end, 93 average in that final, but the four finals that he lost, the average is 96, 96, 101, 104. So he's been playing well in these finals. It's not like he's not been turning up and maybe he was due a a little bit of luck. But is this going to be the time for Luke Humphreys? I think he's playing well enough if he can bring the game that he's been 
playing over the last three months to Blackpool, he is going to be a contender. So for me, it's whether he can put it all together for that one week. Maybe he does blitz through the field or maybe he gets a, a little bit of luck on the way, which is might have been missing at times. But it could be this month. It could be the Winter Gardens when he does win that first major. And I think not many people would be surprised if it is him lifting the Phil Taylor trophy this year. We'll see and we'll obviously uh, discuss in more detail going forward who we think will win the Phil Taylor trophy. But let's talk about the beaten finalist Dirk van Dijvenbode's latest bid for a first PDC stage title, whether on the European tour or in a major, fell short. Another last leg decider to go uh, with the one he had um, in the World Series finals a couple years ago. Um, He said in his words um, afterwards that he, uh, quote, choked in the final. Uh, How do you see him regrouping from this uh, latest setback? Yeah, you know what you're going to get with Dirk van Dijvenboda in an interview. He's always going to give you his honest opinion. He's not going to shy away from telling you how he's feeling. And we, we saw that on Sunday night, as you said there, in, in his own words, I choked again. I, I should have easily won. And watching after the, the final, the, the presentation, it was hard not to feel a, a little bit of empathy towards Dirk. That search for that first stage title in the PDC, it goes on five finals He's made now the World Grand Prix, two in the World Series now, two on the the Euro Tour this year, and three of those, including at the weekend, losing in last leg deciders, and they are defeats that are going to hurt. And I remember we spoke about Dirk just after the first of those Euro Tour finals against Gerwin Price, that was back in March, and we said, how does he bounce back? And we said, it's easier said than done, but he's got to dust himself down, go again, and What did he do after that final? A few weeks later, he wins a floor title, his third of the year. Puts himself in that position again to win that first stage title of the weekend. Again, we we spoke about Luke Humphreys, the run that he put to get to that final. Same with Dirk, 100 average to beat Andrew Gildin, 6-2 in his first game. Then puts that marker down on the Sunday afternoon, the 107 average to beat Dimitri Vandenberg, 6-0. And the, the final session of the weekend, getting the better of Michael Smith, in a tight one, 6-4, Joe Cullen, 7-6 in that last leg decider. And the game against Joe as well, the last leg on throw takes out that 78 finish in two darts, a 14-dart leg, a game that had its nervy moments. But at the end of it, he was able to produce that quality leg that got him over the line on throw. And it looked like he was going to do it in the final, 7-5 up. Luke Humphreys, 12-dart on throw. OK, there's not much he could have done in that leg apart from throw a 9 dart, But the 14th leg... Misses uh, inside for the 112, comes back with three darts at double eight, only uses one of them, the first dart going into that single 16, which, um, yeah, that's a, a tough dart to regroup from. But the decider, Luke Humphreys, wires those darts at double 10, gets that second chance, misses two darts at tops, and the two final legs of the final, Luke wins them 17 and 19 darts. So you're talking a, a low 80s average there that's got him over the line. So, That's going to be hard to shake off for Dirk, but I think he's got to look at two things for me. And the first is other players for inspiration, in in particular the Euro Tour. You've got Rob Cross, who's just won his first Euro Tour title with the eighth attempt, the eighth final, lost the first seven, got over the line eventually. And on a bigger scale, you look at the likes of Michael Smith, lost eight major finals, then won the Grand Slam. He's now world champion, world number one. Peter Wright lost his first five finals, in majors and against Michael Van Gerwen on TV, the record in finals, not for 10, then wins that world championship and went on to win so many other majors as well. So history is there. He can do it. Other players have done it. And I think the other thing really is just himself. And he touched on it in that post-final interview. He said, you miss so many match darts just because your head is such a storm. I couldn't calm down, but it is what it is. So controlling himself in those moments when you're throwing for the title we know that Dirk, he is a, an explosive player, but staying calm in those crucial moments, that's something that in terms of a, a stage title, he's not managed to master yet. He's won some big matches, some dramatic matches, but when it's come to the, the crunch, winning a, a title, something that he's not been able to, to do. So there are two things I think he needs to work on is that staying calm in those crucial moments. And if he needs a bit of inspiration, look at what other players have, have done in the past. Yeah, it's a, a lot of what I was going to say as well. 
you know, I think the biggest thing, though, it's the same thing that I remember us saying about Michael Smith. And that's, you know, why I think you're right saying, like, look at those other players for inspiration, but not just Michael Smith, some other players over the last six, seven years that we've been doing this. What we have said about those players is they have to just keep remembering if they're good enough to get into the position to win a major, that means they're good enough to win a major. If you can get to the line, you're ready. The fact that you didn't cross it, the fact that you, whether it's like uh, Dirk Van Dyvenboda busting first start in hand at double eight by hitting the single 16, whether it's that, whether it's uh, Peter Wright missing those three darts to win the Premier League, um, or sorry, the six darts to win the Premier League, like he did was it seven years ago now. If you're good enough to get to that point, that means you're ready to cross the line and win a major or in this case, to win a Euro Tour event. And the fact that you didn't can't stop you. It shouldn't stop you. It's only you that would let it stop you. You have to remember that you are that good. That's why you're there. The fact that you've blown multiple opportunities, at least in your mind, you've blown multiple opportunities, means you're good enough to create multiple opportunities. And it means you're good enough to create multiple more. And it's a tough mindset to have. And we've seen like how long it affected Peter Wright. Yes, he went after he missed those darts at double in the Premier League and went and won um, a Players Championship event. But very soon thereafter, he did regress for some period of time. He had been he, he had been maybe not as good as Michael Van Guren up to that point over the course of the season, but he had been closer to him than he had ever been before, and he fell back after that. And eventually, he did step up his game and a couple years later won the world championship and then he won a world match plan he won another world championship he won plenty of other majors including as that first world championship being over michael van guren dirk van dyven Boda's time will come it could very well come um, in blackpool in a couple weeks time if it doesn't it could very well come in one of the three remaining euro tour events or the other five majors at the back end of the year he needs to remember that the fact that he got to that position that he had, he ended up throwing four darts at double to win the title. But he actually had six because if you bust for a start at double eight, you actually had two darts that you never got to use. So he really had six darts to win this match. And if he's good enough to be in that position, he's good enough to actually do it. Getting to the line is the hardest part. Crossing it is in the end much easier. There's so much you have to do to get to that line. It's a myth that the hardest dart to hit in darts is the winning dart. No, every dart that leads up to that combined is so much harder. Yes, okay, it might be the single individual hardest, but it takes so much time, practice, determination, luck, and skill just to get there in the first place. And that's what Dirk needs to tell himself, because if he tells himself that, he'll bounce back quicker. He knows that, and he will remember that. And it, it's just how long does it take to remember that? Accepting that you choked is not a bad thing. It's actually really a good thing, because if in order to choke, you had to have been in position to begin with. And that means he's one of the best players in the world. And that's how I think he needs to regroup. He just needs to remind himself that he only was able to choke because he was good enough to get there in the first place. And once he reminds himself that, once he gets back there, once he realizes that he was able to get in that position, even in what wasn't his best tournament, his three averages on Sunday evening were 95, 93, and 91, and he still nearly won the title. That's how good he is. And that's why he will regroup and come back even stronger. Well, there you go, Dirk. If you're listening, there's our words of inspiration for you to get over the line next time. And who knows, could be in the world match play later this month. And we're going to be talking about the draw in a moment. But before then, let's get to our first guest on this week's show. He is the boss of Shot Darts. He's here to talk about Michael Smith joining up with them at the weekend. Here's our chat with Peter McCormick. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by the Managing Director of Shot Darts, Peter McCormick. Thanks very much for joining us, Peter. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. It's an uh, exciting few days. Definitely has been, and there's only one place to start, and that is with the news that broke on Saturday. The secret's out. Michael Smith has signed with Shot Darts. What have these last few days been like since the announcement went out there? 
Oh, it's just been absolutely ballistic, to be honest. You I mean, um, I, I knew we'd get some, you know, ripples through the industry and a lot of excitement, but the messages that I've had from, you know, different players, different businesses, and even just bands from across the world has been amazing. It was a substantially bigger response than I thought. I, I knew it was big news in, for the industry, but um, just the feedback from Dart fans around the world of how, how good they believe the fit's going to be for both parties has been you know, sort of absolutely blown me away, to be honest. That people have seen what we were trying to do and seeing how well that will fit with with Michael and his personality and his goals, and there's a, a pretty neat match there. Definitely, and we were speaking off air. You're in the Netherlands at the moment as part of the launch of Michael's new darts. How long have you been over here in Europe from New Zealand, and what have you been up to? Yeah, well, I um, arrived here on Wednesday last week and um, had a had a few days getting everything ready, and then we did a a pre-launch with some some key customers on Sunday, and then we've had Michael here for Monday and Tuesday with us, with meeting with customers and going through everything, and um, just really just discussing with key accounts, and then going live to the global markets from here. Michael had. I make it or take um, eight or ten interviews with, with various media around the world to do. So we did all that from here on Monday and Tuesday and just before he jumped on a plane to head to Poland. So he sort of literally came straight from <laughs> the tournament on, on Sunday straight to here and then yeah, straight from here to Poland. So he's had a, he's had a big week. We'll come back to Michael uh, a bit later on, but I was having a look at the history of Shot Darts. It's a company that's been running now for more than 50 years, founded back in 1970. It's run through the McCormick family. Can you share with our listeners the story behind it all? Yes, so my dad um, founded the business in 1970, so we've been going a little way, and in those days, you know, dad just sort of set out with the idea of, you know, can he be the biggest... Um, dark company in New Zealand. In those days, there was two dark companies in New Zealand um, making darts there, and eventually grew from from there. Just initially was making paper dart boards, and then broke into making darts, and then bristle boards, and then Dad sort of set himself the goal of getting into the Australian market in the early seventies, and then reached further afield through the Pacific, and then went into the US. So it's been a, a slow progression, really. Uh, but, you know, typically because of the, the company name and the brand name being Puma was um, good in some areas, but not so good into the US or, or Europe, which we never really thought about. The fact that another quite big sporting brand called Puma might not agree with us coming in under that. So hence, 15 years ago, we had to make the decision to rebrand and reset up. And that's when the shop, shop brand was launched. Out of respect for the legacy and the family, we've kept the, the business that was Puma Dart products. But, um, but we now trade pretty much everywhere as Shot Darts, and that's the, the brand that we promote and push. We're still manufacturer manufacture all of our high end darts in New Zealand. The you know brass, etc., is made in Asia, but um, tungsten darts are still machined by itself. We do all of our own plating, but no titanium plants and ceramic coating plants. All of those in house. So. Yeah, it's, it's pretty special what we do. And 1997, you come on board as part of the team. Six years later, 2003, you stepped up as the MD of the company, and that's going to be 20 years this year in that role as the head of the company. Does it feel like it's been 20 <laughs> years, or has that time flown by? Well, it's flown by. Yeah, 20 years, obviously, with the, the sudden demise of Dad, I was lucky to have the opportunity to be trained by him before I sort of got dropped in it so it was the first few years was a bit chaotic sort of learning the ropes and finding my own way through but I was very lucky my sister Julie came into the business at the same time and and helped me out and you know we sort of got things from there so it's been a yeah 20 years has just disappeared really it's surprising how quick it goes and we just keep sort of expanding market by market and we've just you know grown a a lot more than people realize I think it's one of the things that people misconceive about us they look at us and think oh you know just a small dart brand from new zealand but people just don't realize how big we've we've become you know we are the the market leader in the southern hemisphere amongst branded darts we're the market leader in the u.s so we're you know a lot bigger in our territories than people give us credit for so 
Now, the next step now was of Europe, which we've been in Europe for a number of years, but we're definitely getting stronger and stronger here. And now, especially with Michael on board, moving more into the UK. Yeah, I was going to say, in terms of the, the growth of shot darts, I was reading you export darts to more than 70 different countries, and you mentioned about your sister being involved. How big is the team that you've got at Shot working behind the scenes to make it the success that it is? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're a good-sized team. I won't give away the exact number. But, um, you know, we're, there's a decent amount of us, and, and I guess probably the important thing that people think about with We've doubled in the last just over three years, and and I think we'll probably double again in the next two, um, just purely with the growth trajectory we're on and the position we're moving ourselves into the market. So it's it's very exciting, but for me, everything's about about people. Um, it's my go-to. I've got a most amazing team. We've got you know, the core of the staff that have been with us for greater than 10 years, so it's awesome. So the new people have been able to come in and just blend right in with the old. So it makes it a lot of fun. We we definitely enjoy what we do. We're very privileged to work in a fun industry and we, we have fun doing what we do. Good to hear. And being in New Zealand, working with people from around the world, how challenging is that juggling the, the different time zones? There's quite a time difference between us here in UK and New Zealand. Is that tricky to work with at times? Yeah, it's that, that, that's definitely a challenge. I mean, there's my core of the sales team works at pretty unusual hours, and, and I'm the same. That's not unusual to you know get up at two or three o'clock in the morning to to make a call or, or do a Zoom meeting. That's just the reality, and you know it, you spend a lot of time in airplanes and a lot of time travelling. I typically spend three months a year offshore. My sales guys much the same, so. We're out and about, which you know is, is great. It's nice and positive to get to see different people around the world and enjoy the different cultures. But by the same token, you you spend a bit of time away from your family as well. So um, there's pluses and minuses. Definitely. We'll get back to the players that you've got on the books at shot even before Michael is a, a growing stable of players Devin Peterson Roby John Rodriguez Raymond Smith to name a few. What's it been like working with the pros and, and seeing the team grow in that aspect as well? Yeah, it's been an interesting one for us, given you know with our, our the way we've grown with our own you know style and, and craftsmanship and doing our more themed ranges. It's been quite different. Our development's been in the house, you know, and working with you know a, a few different people just to get our designers right and, and, and imagery right. Whereas going into the players section, it, it's quite it's quite unique because you definitely have got to really design the dart for the player first and foremost and get that right and then have a look at it and see what we can do to add some of our unique shot flair to it. So it's definitely a balance, but, you know, I've, you know, with being a family business, I was taken to dart tournaments since I was, you know, four or five years old. So I'm pretty used to how, how it works and knowing your way around and, you know, dart players are great. I mean, they're really happy to share with you what they want on their dart and how it works. And I haven't come across a, a player yet that doesn't really know what they're looking for. And you can just, as long as you listen and, and just tweak each one. And the good thing is, because we do everything in-house, that, you know, if someone wants a, a sample done, well, we we'll, you might know, literally walk out and have a ch- chat to the guys on the machines and we start making it. So it's, it's nice and easy. And, you know, this is the process through with, with, with Michael Smith was... You know, we just get each part of the dart finished exactly what is wanted, go to the next part, and we just work our way through. And yes, it was a process, but it, um, as long as you you work with them and you listen and you just design to exactly what they need, what they're looking for and what they need, it just sort of pops out the other end. Well, let's circle back to Michael Smith. And we saw at the weekend he posted shortly after the announcement on Twitter, it was two years ago, that he was sent a proposal by his manager from you guys at Shot. It was a relationship which has grown since then. So how does something like this come together over a a long period like that, signing one of the world's top players? Yes, it it, it was one of those things. We sort of had this, you know, we we put a proposal to him and said, let's have a chat about it. And we... um, we sort of jumped on for what was planned to be a short Zoom, and I think we ended up talking for an hour and a half, and and most of it, we just chatted about life, um, and we just sort of worked out pretty quick that it was going to be a really good fit between us, that, you know, what Michael was looking for goals and what we were looking for gelled together, and the more we chatted, the, the more we got on, and, you know, I, I talked to him every day, 
and um, and that's just the relationship we have, and it's just amazing. So we we communicate, and, and when you're chatting with someone every day, you work out pretty quick what they're looking for and what their needs are, and it, it just sort of flowed from there. So it's been a even though I say it's basically two years, but the time has just disappeared. It was you know sort of three months ago when we sort of looked at each other, thought, "Geez, we better start getting all the stuff made." You know, the time is cracking, cranking on. So um, the, the guys at the factory have been running the best part of you know six and a half days and, and long hours for the last three months to get everything in place and, and stock ready for launch. So it's been a, a busy time for us all in New Zealand, but um, immensely re- a rewarding and a heck of a lot of fun as well called it a, a dream come true to have Michael at shot his stature in the game world number one world champion it's a, a massive coup for shot what does it mean for the company to have him on board oh well it's, it's it, it is and the word is just massive for us it, it you know as I say we've done so well with doing things our way and with our themed ranges but for us to go to that next level we really did need to get to that top 10 player and that's what we sort of targeted so let's try and get a top 10 player and you know all of a sudden you know we we managed to you know strike gold to a certain degree that you know we, we signed Michael then all of a sudden he's world number one in the champion so that's just been a, a perfect storm for us and you know all of that everything's fallen in place which is really going to allow us to expand more especially into Europe but, um, and in the UK where player base starts are so you know so important it's such a key element that um, yeah it's just going to really open those doors for us and allow us to grow even more yeah it's good timing and with social media these days it's hard to keep these announcements under wraps did you ever think you'd be able to make it a surprise for everyone or would that have been wishful thinking and I guess for you guys how do you keep quiet yourselves when I'm sure it's an announcement that you want to tell everyone about yeah, it is, and you know, exactly. And you know, we we just did our best to keep it as quiet as we could. You I mean that's you know the professional way you do things, and you know, obviously you've got to respect as existing sponsor and those sorts of things. So we we did our best to keep it under wraps. But you know, by the time you start getting packaging printed and um, samples made and, and different things, it, it's very hard to keep it out. And I mean, at the end of the day, the dart industry is pretty small. You mean, <laughs> and I think. It, Everybody pretty well much knows each other and, and obviously people talk. So we did our best to keep it under wraps. And I, I know we managed to surprise a few people, but um, I know there were a few in the industry that knew as well. And uh, the, the launch of Michael's Ranger Darts, that's going to be on July 13th. So Thursday next week for our listeners, I, I assume you were following his first tournament with the new darts at the weekend, seeing him throw 101, 111 averages in his first two games. You can't ask for a, a better advertisement than that, can you? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm not going to lie and say I wasn't nervous because I was. I was just sort of sitting, there, sitting there, and I know Michael had been practicing with them, but not not a massive amount. Given he's you know had so many tournaments on and so many big events on, he really you know couldn't sort of put away his current darts. So um, it was really you know only full time with him for basically a week before he could get going. So it was. It was nerve wracking, but um, I mean, he seemed to find the doubles so well in that first game, and I took a big sigh of relief. I thought, okay, you know, <laughs> it's, it's all good. And then the, the, the average was great in the next match, so no, we're very pleased with it all. Well, let's finish up lastly back with Shot Darts as a, a company overall. You've got the world number one signed up, so what's next? Are there any other targets you've got in mind as a, a company for the next few years or even long term beyond that? Yeah, look, the, the main thing for us is that we, we definitely are, you know, expanding in, into the more of the European now and UK markets. That's our goals for the next little bit. But, um, you know, we'll just focus and, and, and keep growing in these markets and, and expand and, and really work closely with, with Michael. We'll use, you know, his, his ranges to, to open some doors that haven't been opened to us. So once we get those open, we'll get more products into those and we'll just keep growing. But for us, we'll just keep doing our journey and, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty grassroots people and we just sort of keep, you know, head down, butt up and we just get the job done and we just enjoy what we're doing. So we'll just keep keep doing what we do and as long as we do that and put out great products and, and listen to dart players as to what they need, you know, our products will still keep um, disappearing off the shelves. It um, works for everybody. 
Well, we look forward to following what happens next, Peter, and congratulations on the signing of Michael Smith and appreciate you taking the time and we wish you all the best for what else is to come this year as well. No, awesome and you know, happy to chat any time. It's, um, it's, just, yeah, it's just truly an exciting event for us and um, we're going to do the right thing and make sure we, we make everybody proud of what we do. Attention all dart enthusiasts, this is ZR, your host from In The Mud Sports, and I have an exciting announcement for you. Are you ready to take your darting experience to the next level? Introducing In The Mud Sports, the premier online darts league for amateurs like yourself. We're not your typical darts league, it's an experience like no other. It's where you can showcase your skills, make new friends, and have an absolute blast. We have a vibrant community where camaraderie is key and darts meets pure enjoyment. Whether you're a singles player or love the excitement of team events, In The Mud Sports has got you covered. We are perfect for amateurs who want to have fun and improve their game. Along the way, it is your time to shine. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to elevate your darting experience and join 80 plus players from all around the world. Together, we'll create unforgettable moments on and off the hockey. You can catch all updates about where we are going live next through it, Twitter and Instagram at In The Mud Sports. See you guys there. Thanks again to Peter for joining us now. Looking ahead to the world match play and earlier today when we were recording the draw for Blackpool was made. Colin Lloyd, the former champion, helping out with the draw. And let's talk about some of the ties that Jaws has made for the tournament for the first round. What ties immediately caught your eye? Well, I had not actually watched the draw, draw live, so when you said Colin Lloyd, I'm like, wait, we, uh, did, I, did I miss something? Um, but I'm glad I listened to the rest of the question there. It's been quite some time since Colin Lloyd last was in the world match play. Of course, former champion with a 170 finish to win it um, quite a while ago. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what a field we have. You know, if you look at the rankings, 30 of the top 31 players in the world have qualified. Um, Callan Ritt's the only top 31 player who hasn't. The only two from outside include our guest, Mike Dedecker, as well as um, some guy named Steve Beaton. I don't know if it, I, I know he wasn't in it last year. I don't know if this is his debut as well or not, uh, but a pretty, pretty good field. I was talking with you um, offline about it, and I was like, you know, I, I could have picked 14 ties out from here. I mean, there's two that clearly stand out, but there's a dozen other ones that are really good, and the two that I that are probably the weakest or probably the ones that are going to end up being the best and are going to go to a tiebreaker out of nowhere. So it's always such a great tournament, um, but I'm going to pick three. I'm going to start with someone who, well, he's been in the world match play for over a decade now, but very weird seeing him qualify through the pro to order of merit as Gary Anderson has dropped out for a while, was number two in the world. Now is not even the top 16, but he's playing better than he's played in a few years now, he's playing. He's enjoying the game more than he has in a very long time. Uh, he seems to be dedicated to rising back up the rankings, and well, that only makes him more dangerous than he already would have been, which is pretty darn dangerous. And he's going against someone who earlier in the show I mentioned has only won two Euro Tour titles this year, who only looks to be right there in that same conversation with Luke Humphreys and Dirk Van Dijvenboda for that next first time major winner in Dave Chisnell. I think that's a really tough first round match for both of them because both of them are playing the best starts they've had in a few years. Both of them are going to be coming in thinking that this could be their week. Um, yes, Gary's won it before, but it's been so long now that this would be in many ways like a first major for him because it's been four years since he's won one. Uh, Dave Chisnell obviously has still not won a televised title despite being on the brink for over a decade. But two other matches I'll mention. Damon Hedda, yes, he's won the World Cup, but he's not won a singles major yet. And Josh Rock, another one of those players in that conversation for next first-time major winner. I think that match speaks for itself. Damon Hedda, uh, he's playing as well as he's ever played, and that's pretty good to begin with. He's He won his first title of the year just a couple weeks ago in a, a Players' Championship event, but he's been close in many events. Uh, brilliant on the Euro Tour, but also brilliant everywhere. Damon Hedda is a future major champion as well, I think. Uh, very well could be a future world champion because I don't know where his peak game is. 
I know he's still getting there. But Josh Rock's a future everything. Josh Rock could be a future world number one, and that future might not be that far off. Um, just a terrible first round draw for both of them because they're both players that should be not necessarily dark horses, but in that second tier of players that you would say as favorites to win this entire entire tournament. And the odds reflect that. I mean, Josh Rock is the sixth favorite at 20 to one. Damon Hedda is 50 to one. I think that is tremendous value because, well, he shouldn't be 50 to one. He has more than a one in 50 chance of winning this title. One of them is going to go out first match. Um, I think those two ties, though, are the two best. But I'll pick one more. Um, another match involving a resurgent player hasn't been in the field in five years. Granted, he was retired for one of those years. Raymond Van Barneveld. He won a title very quick back out of retirement, but I don't think he ever was playing anywhere near how good he's been playing recently. Beating Michael Van Guren at the Euro Tour is just part of what has been a renaissance of a six months for Barney. I'm not going to say Barney's anywhere near where he was when he was world number one, when he was world champion, when he was every bit as good as Phil Taylor. But he's as good, if not better, than he's been in seven, eight, nine years. This is a Barney that I don't think can win this title. But the fact that he's playing confident, he's playing, having fun, that he's that he believes in himself, all of that combined makes him a lot more dangerous than he might otherwise appear. And Ryan Searle, there's been some inconsistencies in his game, but I think he's starting to get back on track. I think this could be a really entertaining match. I think he can go the entire way, and I think both of them could play at a really high standard. This is, that's a match I'm looking forward to. Some good picks there, and we said off there we were going to pick three games each. Was I going to pick the same three games as you did? I've got one of those three that you've got down here, but I've got two different ones and I'll start with the one that I've got the same as you to get that out the way we don't want to talk about it too much and give it the big build and it end up being a, a one-sided game but I've, I've got down here Dave Chisnell Gary Anderson I think going into the draw we knew that Gary Anderson was going to be on that list of pro tour qualifiers the first time I think since 2010 I read somewhere that he's been on that list he's usually been on the other side as you say as high as world number two he's been much higher in the, the world rankings not to worry about being a, a pro tour qualify he's not been spoiler in the draw but that's the position he is for this year coming through that pro tour list and winning a, a title getting back to winning ways on the floor at least and against Dave Chisnell someone that has had some success this year winning two Euro Tour titles he's been playing some excellent stuff and we, we speak about it all the time is this going to be the time for him to win that first major title well not much uh tougher draws you can get for the first round on the way to doing that but if you can get past Gary Anderson the two of them they've had some epic battles in the past they've played in world championships they've played I think the most uh, memorable one is the, the Premier League semi-finals back in I want to say 2015 time 2016 something like that so they've been playing each other for a long time first time they're going to play at the world match play though which will be good to see and hopefully both of them will be on top form and we will get a a game which many people are calling the tie of the first round, it will live up to that stature in the end. And the two other games I've got down here from one game that's going to be a first for the Winter Gardens to one that's got so much history behind it. Rob Cross, Daryl Gurney, and in my work at the moment, I'm putting together a 30 world match play most memorable matches. I've managed to say that without stuttering, but this is the, the 30th year of the match play. I've picked out 30 games. Spoiler alert, the 2019 semi final. Rob Cross, Daryl Gurney, that is in that top 30 list. Rob Cross was 14-7, 15-10 down in that game. Daryl Gurney missing those four darts to go 16-10, one leg away. And Rob Cross winning seven legs in a row to win the match. And the following night wins the title. And they've played each other since then. But the first time I think they're going to play each other on that stage since that game, which uh, yeah carries quite a bit of history behind it. So I'm looking forward to that one. And my last one I'm going to go for... Not sure what the standard's going to be like for this one. I think we'll see more high-quality games. But the one that I'm really intrigued about is Peter Wright against Andrew Gildon. It is a, an East Anglian derby. You've got Peter Wright defending that prize money from two years ago and how well he played two years ago to win this title. We were calling it Phil Taylor-esque, which is one of the highest compliments you can get in darts. That is how well he played that week. Well, he's going to have to find some of that form in a few weeks' time in Blackpool if he's going to defend a, a large chunk of that money. And... 
a tough draw. The, the last major winner, Andrew Gildin, in terms of singles majors, I should say. But Andrew Gildin, for many people, it'll be the first time they've seen him play since Minehead. If, if you don't watch the Euro Tour or the Players' Championship events, first time you'll get to see Andrew Gildin. And who knows if he could make it back-to-back majors after winning that UK Open. He's, he's going to be full of confidence, I think, still from winning that title. And Peter Wright, not in the best of form, but he's going to need to find that form. I think for me, that is one of the most intriguing ties in that first round. Well, I I know I'm looking forward uh, to it and uh, can't believe you only picked one of my three. I guess that means two of yours, you're, you're wrong to have picked them. <laughs> but we'll, as I mentioned, we will talk more about the world match play over the next couple of weeks um, and hopefully have some more players on from it. But let's uh, switch tacks and talk about uh, the WDF, the World Match Play, of course, is the PDC's second most prestigious uh, ranking event. The World Masters is the WDF's. But as we had speculated, and as many people thought, the WDF have confirmed that there will not be a World Masters held in 2023, although they say it will return in 2024. How big of a blow is this announcement for the WDF? Yeah, from one event, the World Match Play, that we've got just over a week before we can watch it to another event which we're gonna have to hang tight for a a lot longer the world masters now not coming back until 2024 and we're not quite sure on a a date for that either at the moment but yeah it is a blow and nick rolls the secretary general of the wdf we had him on as a guest back in february we were talking about the world masters and we're hopefully going to get him back on for a, a chat in the next few weeks and we'll let you guys know in advance if you want to get your questions in for that so do keep an eye on our social media but in the statement he he spoke about it himself Nick the the huge disappointment at not being able to get everything signed off to get the world masters on in in 2023 and he went on to speak in that statement about long-term planning going away from the one-year deals for these major events the world championship that's now got that three-year deal in place and he wants to bring that same level of stability to the world masters and I guess the longer you leave it, the more uncertainty there is, the more talk there is going to be on social media. And it's important, I think, for any organisation that you give the players that level of transparency. They know what's going on. And the WDF, they did set that final deadline of the end of June, which was this past weekend. That was going to be when they were going to decide one way or another if the World Masters was going to go ahead this year. And the statement came out this week that, unfortunately, it's not going to go ahead this year and it's a shame because it's an event which we had to wait three years for it to come back last year and now we're going to get another blank year this year in tournaments history but I think for me looking further ahead these next 6-12 months for the future of the WDF I think they're hugely important and possibly the most important in terms of their long-term future because it's vital now that they get this next period right they've got the world championship in place as I said that's going to be happening in December at Lakeside. We're not sure on the TV coverage. The price fund has not been confirmed for those. They've got the prices down for the tickets this year, which is a, a good thing. And hopefully they're going to make that a bigger success than last year. They're going to sell more tickets, make it a bigger spectacle and, and really build off that going into 2024, which, as I say, I think that could be a, a crunch year for them to get the World Masters on. I said when we spoke about the WDF last time, For me, I'd put the World Masters on in June. Then you've got that even split across the year from their two majors, the Worlds in December, the Masters in June. So, yeah, it's it's very important now. Get those two events in order. They're the two events that the players that play in the WDF, they play for all year. The travelling, the hotels, the cost involved. A lot of these players, they're not professionals. They're semi-pros, amateurs. A lot of it, they pay out of their own pocket to play in these events. So, it's it's crucial now you get these events in place lakeside you get the world masters which involves a lot more players from around the world and i think just lastly in terms of the headlines coming out of the wdf we're seeing events under the wdf structure that not organized directly by them but by their members they're being cancelled it's it's not a good look and there's only so much the wdf can do but there needs to be some good news some positivity for the players and fans that follow the WDF to cling on to. So, yeah, it's, as an organisation that's going to succeed, it needs to get everything in order. And I think now's a, a crucial time for the WDF in their long term future is getting this World Masters right and getting everyone on board. 
Yeah, it's it, it's tough to take find positives in this. So there's certainly positive routes that they can take from this, but I don't think we can find any positives in the announcement itself. You know, I the WDF got a lot of flack and rightfully so for the postponement of the world championships from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, especially after they had the qualifiers late last year for those last spots and they had the cutoff and everyone knew who was in or not. Then you find out that, Oh, that's just for an event over a year from now. And sure. The FIFA world cup qualifiers finish a year ahead of the event, but that's because they're on a four year schedule. This is a one year schedule and players we're competing the entire year under the understanding, if not promise, that the world championships would happen. And then suddenly they were, for all intents and purposes, canceled. And be, and you were told, no, actually, it's a year from now. A similar thing has now happened with the World Masters. The big difference is the WDF hadn't announced the World Masters. They had, from the beginning of the year, made clear that there was something they were hoping to have on the calendar, but things were still under discussion. They were still trying to make sure everything was in play. But they kept delaying and delaying and delaying the announcement. And considering how often this pattern has replayed itself recently, there's a credibility problem that I didn't think would be developed, but I think has developed. And by I didn't think, I mean, I don't mean I didn't think a couple weeks ago. I didn't think a couple years ago would develop. The WDF doesn't have the credibility that I thought it would get. They have the right idea in not announcing things until they're set in stone. But they've still promised that they will announce these things. And they haven't come to fruition. And it's happened a couple times too much. For some of them, they had a valid excuse. You know, with COVID, we could not predict what would happen three months from now, let alone a year. And plans had to remain fluid. But we're now beyond that. Yes, COVID still exists, but it's no longer a, a pandemic. It's an epidemic. It is part of our life. And we can prepare with very reasonable assurances that our plans will be able to come to fruition. And the WDF still have not been able to do that. Having a three-year plan for the world championships, I think, is a good start. And if a few months from now, the WDF have a three-year plan for the world masters, then that gets back to what I said at the beginning. There are positive routes to take from this. But they're going to need something like that to make up for the credibility blow that has come between this and the world championships over the past six to nine months. They need to make sure that they have found a place, not just for 2024, but for the next few years so that people aren't continuously asking, is this going to happen? Is this a one-off or is this now part of this calendar? Should I be going and chasing ranking points in Latvia and Hungary and wherever else, Turkey or wherever there is an event going on that the WDF gives ranking points for? They need to be able to show that for the next few years, this is all in play. If they can do that, they have taken a positive route from this to start to build back that credibility. And if those events do end up going ahead, if the World Championship does happen in 2023 and the World Masters does happen at some point next year, then that credibility will start to rebuild itself. Uh, but they have a lot of work to do because right now, I, I don't see the WDF as a credible organization uh, because I think this has just happened at least one, if not two or three times too many. We'll be back in a few minutes with some listener questions to finish off the show. But before then, let's get to our final guest on this week's show. He is going to be one of the debutantes in the world match play this year. Here's our chat with Mike Decker. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by one of the debutantes in the world match play this year, Mike Dedeka. Thanks for the time, Mike. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. And we're talking only a, a few hours after the draw was made for Blackpool. You've drawn Joe Cullen in the first round for your debut. Did you watch the draw? What was your reaction when you found out? No, I didn't watch the draw at all. I got a 
message from my manager with a picture of the draw. Um, oh, oh, it's a fun game. Uh, it's going to be a fun game. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Well, we'll come back to the match play later, but it's been a, a little while since we had you on the show back in November 2021, just before you made your Grand Slam debut that week. Didn't go according to plan for you, but what did you take away from getting no. those three games up on stage in front of the cameras? Uh, it was a learning curve. Um, uh, I was so happy that, that, that I qualified. And um, um, I think the pressure got a bit, got too much of me um didn't know how to handle all the the, the media attention and and the the boom in belgium is is like there's a lot more people um watching dogs now and they're expecting a lot more that 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 didn't happen for the for the before the three years that have, have been passed now um so yeah but but i'm getting over it and i'm more used to playing on stage and in front of crowds and cameras and and the attention so it, it's all the, the little things they they help with the development of my game on stage so yeah definitely and want to come back to that point you made about the boom of darts in, in Belgium but uh, a few weeks after the Grand Slam it was the last chance qualifiers to get to Ali Pali you narrowly lost out in that final round you would end up getting a, a late call up to play in the tournament but when you lost out in the qualifiers how tough was that time before the call up thinking that you would have to go back to Q school <laughs> that was hell um because um well to be honest I missed so many doubles in that game so uh, if I should have easily won it and then you lose and then you know well at that point you're thinking yeah that's it I have to go back to Q school so but then I think five minutes after my game I got a message from a good friend saying, yeah, your first reserve for the Worlds. And that was when the pandemic was still going on. Um, so, yeah, you start thinking, like, well, people from from other other countries, maybe they have problems or get corona. So so you're, you're kind of hoping that, that someone drops out. But then, you know, if you hope too much, it's not going to happen. So, yeah, it was a nervous, nervous time then. Um, I was glad that I got a phone call on the 6th of December. Yeah, you get that call up, the news that Charles Losper, the South African qualifier, wouldn't be able to make yeah. it to the tournament. You were going to be his replacement. I'm guessing you've not experienced a, a range of emotions like that from being in hell, as you called it, to then the joy of being involved in, in that tournament and, as a result, getting to keep your tour card. Yeah, because um, it was funny, though. I was... Um, I was thinking if I get to to, to Ali Pali, just the first round, and my tour card was secure, but it wasn't. But I didn't know, and then um, I played my first game, and I won it. And then my manager told me, yeah, now your tour card is safe. I, I, so I'm glad that I thought that my tour card was safe, because <laughs> otherwise I had too much pressure on that one game. Definitely, and your debut at the, the World Championship, that was the year before when there were no fans there, and you, you said to us last time that you wanted to experience it with that full crowd. So what was that moment like, walking out at Ali Pali with the full crowd and, and playing on that stage? Yeah, it's it's, it's a brilliant feeling. Um, it's the one tournament that, that everyone really works at. Um, if you're not in the world, you're not really a part of the... That's how I feel, then you're not really a part of the professionals. Because, like, there's uh, 96 players playing in it, so and you have 128 tour card holders. So if you're not in that one, then that it's a big miss in your year. Um, so yeah, well, it was, it's it's a good feeling playing there, knowing it's the biggest tournament in the world. You know, everyone's watching it. So that's the one you really want every year. And I'm sure you would have liked to have been the one that did it, but your opponent in that first game, Darius Labanowski, was throwing the, the nine data against you. What do you remember about that? I was thinking if he's going to keep this up, then I got no chance. <laughs> but then uh, we went off stage, we both went off stage, and in the, the backstage area, he said, oh, I'm, there's so much adrenaline going through my through my, through my body now. I wish I didn't hit the nine data. <laughs> and I was thinking, hmm. If he if he's not gonna control the, the adrenaline and, and and his nerves, then then maybe his level is gonna drop down a bit, and that's what it did. And mine went higher, so 
And as we mentioned, you end up keeping your tour card. You get into that top 64, and we'll, we'll come on to this year in a moment. But one of the highlights from last year, 2022, it's got to be for you playing on the Euro Tour in Belgium and, and getting a win on that stage. What did that mean to you? Yeah, that was massive. Um, the crowd was so, so respectful. Um, they did it again uh, last last time it was in Belgium this year. Um it, it, it's a brilliant event playing for your home crowd and then them being respectful and showing like to the rest of the world how, how crowds can be because it's not always like that it's, it's, it's something that I enjoy as a, as a Belgian myself yeah you should definitely be proud of the, the crowd something that we've spoke about on the show is, is how good they are in Belgium and, and, and back to yourself the back end of last year we saw you start to go on some deep runs on the pro tour at a quarter final where you averaged 113 but it was only enough to win two legs against Josh Rock how do you process a game like that when you've played at such a high level and, and not won it well I didn't really do much wrong that game he was just the better man um, then you can only shake his hands say congratulations and move on uh, uh, I'd rather well you always want to win but if, if you lose and you play a game like that there's not much you can be disappointed about or, or, or angry about so it was, it was a good game yeah that's it really well not long after that you went even further on the pro tour getting to a, a semi-final you were back at Ali Pali as well at the end of last year you picked up a, another first round win but for players not in the World Series or the Masters at the start of this year what is that long break like before you play in the, in the Pro Tours again at the start of the year do you do anything differently during that break or more hours on the practice board did you do anything else uh, depends uh, usually after the Worlds so I don't pick up my darts for like two or three weeks just take a little break and then I start practicing again well, let's get on to this year and uh, another milestone for you ticked off making your first Pro Tour final and I was looking back at the run that you had that day you won four last leg deciders on the way to making the final so how proud were you to break that new ground get to the final yeah well, that was a brilliant day um, I had a, a, a tough draw as well uh, Luke Humphries um, Gerwin Price then Neil Sonneveld who is who's a steady and, and, and good player on the Pro Tour as well um, and then yeah the final I got cross and, and it was such a long day I was so tired and then the, the the whole thing around all my first final so yeah I was glad that I that I was in the final that I reached my first final and then a bit bit sad that I didn't play anywhere near I did all day well that final helped you on the race to the world match play it's a, a lot different race compared to the Grand Slam where it's just the one day qualifier this is based on performances for the last 12 months so at what point did you start to take notice of that, that you could maybe qualify? Was it after that run to the final in May or was it something that you've had your eye on for a while? Well, to be honest, I was in the in the top 16 of the Pro Tour uh, for that uh, for the match play from the beginning of the year because I had a good end of the last of last year. And um, I started this year somewhere around spot 10, I think, or spot 9. And I've always... All year long, I, I hung around there. I, I, I dropped a spot, uh, went up a spot. So I was thinking if I just keep doing what I'm doing, I'll, I'll be safe. And then I'm luckily that when I did I did two European tours this year. Uh, one was a call up for Risa, and I got to the third round, and then second round in Prague. So that helped a lot. Yeah, you mentioned those two Euro tours this year. One of them got to mention you picked up a, a win against the world number one the world champion Michael Smith as well how special was that win for you um, well I've beaten him before so special you know I've, I've come in a point that, that I'm, I'm not really afraid of, of anyone anymore um, I know what my level is and if I play my best starts I know I can beat anyone Um so really special yeah it's, it's always nice winning against someone like Michael Smith or, or top 10 players because I'll always be the underdog so that's why it's nice but I know that I can beat him regularly so 
That's fair enough. Well, this past weekend, it was the last event before the cutoff for the match play. Your spot was confirmed after the draw was made, I think. So was it nice to sit back and relax at the weekend? Not have to keep an eye on other results like your fellow Belgian Kim Ibrex who got that last spot on Sunday? Well, I've, I've been relaxed for a while. Uh, I've been relaxed after the last pro tours, to be honest. Because uh, spot 17... Uh, was eight eight thousand um, behind me, so and I was spot twelve. So th there had to be a lot going wrong for me for not to be in the the world match play. Definitely, and you touched on it earlier about the growth of darts in Belgium. More coverage on TV. You've got the Euro Tour event, which is now well established this year in the match play. Yourself, Kim, Dimitri van der Berger, a record three Belgian players in the field what do you think that says about the strength of Belgian darts right now um, well we always have good we always had good Belgians on the Pro Tour with Kim and then Ronnie who was a, a top 32 player once uh, then Dimi uh, came onto the Pro Tour and, and, and started doing good things so we always have but now there's just more recognition in Belgium and and um, so yeah, I think that's the only difference that people now know what 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 everyone's doing and and like what you have in England. If Michael Smith walks around, he'll he'll get noticed, and that's what we have in Belgium now as well. Good to hear. And we had Kim on the show a few months ago after he won his title, and he talked about the idea of maybe one day bringing the Premier League to Belgium. Some people have said, why not a, a World Series event or a TV event? Where do you see the next step for growing darts in Belgium? Is it through another PDC event or is there more that can be done maybe at a grassroots level? Yeah, I definitely think they can, can up the game in Belgium, not only a European tour, but that they can look at maybe, like you say, World Series or a Premier League night. Um, they tried the, the European Championships a couple of years back. And hustled, and and but that was before um, the big boom. So I think if they do it now, it, it would be a much bigger event than than when they did it before. Let's so yeah, I think the PDC should definitely look at that. Let's hope so. Well, uh, a few more before we let you go, and let's get back to you. And as we've said, it's a, a debut at the World Match Play for you. But before then, you've got two players' championships at the start of next week how um, good is it to have those two events first as by the time you play in them it would have been around three or four weeks since your last pdc event yeah it's definitely good um you can have a look at form um back to being to playing competitive darts it's it's a good warm-up to the to the world match player yeah. and you've played at some special venues in darts already the winter gardens are another one that you're going to be ticking off very soon it's the, the 30th year of the tournament is held in high regard in darts just behind the world championships what does it mean to you to have qualified for this event for the first time yeah it's a massive achievement um it's a really hard tournament to qualify for um it's 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 where where careers can can get a big big boost look at dimitri he won it a couple of years and now he's a top 10 player so i'm not saying i'm gonna win it but it is possible with those tournaments that you go up in the rankings a lot so we shall see and, and just lastly I'm sure a lot of the focus is on the Pro Tours next week the match play but what are the goals for the rest of 2023 now is the focus going to turn to the maybe the World Grand Prix or have you got your eye on something else a, a first Pro Tour title getting to a certain position in the rankings what's the, the, the goals for you now well my main goal from the start of the year was trying to get in or as close to the top 32 of the world um so that that's the main focus um i'm glad that i qualified now for the world match play but it, it's bonus to to the main goal that i've set for myself same at the grand prix if i've been able if i will be able to qualify for that again it's a bonus and then it's just helping me getting to <laughs> to my main goal and that's getting a lot higher in the rankings well, if you keep qualifying for these major events, that goal of getting in the top 32 is it's not going to be too far away. Mike, it's a pleasure to chat to you. We appreciate the time and wish you all the best with that debut at the World Match Play. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks again to Mike for joining us and we'll finish up the show with some listener questions. The first of them comes from Jack 
Genius Darts. He says, what about the one if you were a darts brand? Who would be your dream free signings for the next 10 years? I like this question. Um, I mean, there's only, again, like uh, the draw for Blackpool, which ties cut you around. There's only three correct answers for this. Um, so we'll see if you're correct or not. Uh, but it's, a, I think, a really, really good question. Um, but I, I do think, I do think it's clear cut. I mean, there's some names that I think are worth considering. Like, like someone like Luke Littler, I think, is worth considering. But I think it's too soon to say that he is a dream signing for the next 10 years. He's moving in the right direction, but I think he's still too young for us to know really where his game's going to go. Is he going to keep his interest in darts? Is he going to keep progressing? And I think it's a, I think it's a, you know, if you're target or whatever, and you have the chance to sign him, you absolutely want to, but I don't think he's on that level of three dream signings at the other end someone like michael van guren uh pete uh well peter wright uh guren price johnny clayton they're at the top of the game already especially like guren price and michael van guren they're probably still going to be at the top of the game in the next 10 years michael smith as well you could say them as being dream signings for that um reason because they're probably the most profitable but you're also having to pay them the most so the potential return on investment um, is more limited. So I'm going in a direction of players who I think have a huge immediate potential uh, ability to emerge towards the top of the game while also not already being there. So there is still that little bit of risk. And I think three names just jump out. The most obvious, Josh Rock. I don't think I need to say anything beyond that. We've talked about him quite a bit over the last year and a half sky i've talked about him like he's already a top 10 player and in many ways he is i i, I think they're right to talk about him like he's a top 10 player because on a good day he de- he is unquestionably um on an average day he's not far off from it if he's not there already uh, but two other names jean van veen if he had managed to get into the top 64 he wasn't that far off but he wasn't also that close but if he had managed to get into the top 64 um, through his uh, appearances in Pro Tour events at the back end of last year, as well as qualifying for the World Championship and some other things, he would have qualified for the World Match Play. He had 18,000 pounds and change on his Pro Tour order merit that would have qualified him towards Blackpool. And you add that to what he's won this year, just since uh, February, that would have been enough to get in. It also would mean he would be guaranteed for the World Grand Prix. He's not there this year. He might still get to the World Grand Prix, but he just keeps getting better. I, I don't know where his peak is. I don't know if he might be better than Josh Rock. I think that is a legitimate possibility because he keeps getting better. And this past weekend on the Euro Tour was the best we've ever seen from him. But I don't think it's the best we will ever see from him. You know, we had one of the, but the eighth highest average ever in Euro Tour history and didn't break a sweat doing that. I think he is a superstar in the making like Josh Rock. It would not surprise me if one day those are the top two players in the world. Uh, but one more, since it is asking for three, and I have to go with Bo Greaves. Um, obviously already the best uh, female player in the world, uh, but I think that elevates her in some ways to another level because of her marketing ability. We've seen Fallon Sherrick's marketing ability. Uh, but I think Bo Greaves has even more potential than Fallon Sherrick. I think she has her A game is the best we've ever seen from a female player. She's getting she's playing at her A game more often. And I think her A game still has room to grow. I don't know how she will do once she does go and gives Q school a shot. And if she wins a tour card plays on the pro tour, I think at the very least right now, she'd be competitive. She'd hold her own. Um, but I think she'd only improve when she does that. But either way, she has such marketability because she is the best female player by quite some distance. So those are the three names I'm going with. Josh Rock, Jean Van Veen, and Bo Greaves. And if you say anyone else, you're wrong. <laughs> well, we had a week off from each other last week, but we are slowly getting back into sync. We were one out of three on the the last uh, one of the last questions about the ties for the world match play we've gone two out of three this time on getting the, the same picks together and 
just want to say shout out to Jack as well for the question. Um, do go and check out his YouTube channel, Genius Darts. It's a, a darts channel that I'm personally subscribed to. I do enjoy his videos, especially the vlogs that he puts out from his experiences playing as well. Well worth a watch. I do go and check him out. And um, yeah, two out of three. Who did I go for that were your ones? Josh Rock, straight off the bat. I mean, as you I'm not going to say too much more than what you said there, but he is one of the, the star names in darts now and still very young. I think 21, 22. Hard to believe that this is his only his second year with that tour card. He's now in the top 32. You'd think he's going to be in that top 16 at, at some point within the next six months. Uh, a player that's got a very exciting future and any manufacturer, if they could get hold of Josh Rock now for the next 10 years, they're, they're going to do very well. So, Josh Rock, I agree with you on that one. Bo Greaves as well, I'm agreeing with you on that one. And I think, uh, again, uh, another young, talented player, 19, 20 around that region, but uh, already achieved so much in the game. And you'd think there's going to be much more to come as well. The ceiling is very high for Bo Greaves. And who knows if we're going to see a go to Q school one day, try and get on the pro tour, get that tour card. If she does, I mean, again, that's quite a story in itself, isn't it? And I think that she would be able to do pretty well in that setting as well. So maybe one day, I think there's still a, a long career ahead of both. So I don't think there's any pressure on her doing it as soon as next year or, or whatever. She's doing pretty well on the uh, the women's circuit, winning the world championship, winning so many titles on the women's series. In a few weeks, we could be saying that she's the, the women's world match play champion as well, which is the, the biggest title in PDC women's starts. So Josh Rock, Bo Greaves, I'm agreeing with you on those two. The third one, I think it's very unlikely we would have um, gone with this one together. But our listeners who follow us on Twitter, they'll be used to the regular tweet every weekend. Whenever the next week lineup goes out for the Modus League, I'm always calling for Jamie Robinson and Benny Armin Simoniedis. I've probably butchered that name, but the, the Greek player from the World Cup a few years ago for those two to be in the week after. So I'm going to give my third spot to Jamie Robinson. He gets his own bespoke set of darts, but also a bit of financial back in there for the next 10 years to maybe play a few more events, get a call up to the Modus League, fulfill that dream. For me anyway, I've seen him play at the live lounge and then I can stop sending that tweet every weekend and we can call for someone else to be in. Well, maybe, uh, maybe next week's the week. Um, now we have one more question. This one comes from John Brett Smith. If a tournament took place that excluded today's top 32, um, who'd be your four semifinalists and uh, who do you think would go on to win it from there? Yes, another good question. And I assume this is just for PDC tour card holders. So anyone outside that top 32 and yeah, I had a little think about this earlier. I think my four semifinalists, the first of them, not just because he's on the show, but Mike the Decker one of only two players outside that top 32 to make the match play this year. So he's been playing pretty well for the last 12 months to get in those spots. A little bit of recency bias because of the weekend, but look at what he's done the last nine or 10 months. Gian Van Veen right up there. He's going to make the last four as well. Jim Williams, I think if he turns up, there's there's been a bit of talk on social media after the weekend. He pulled out of the Euro Tour, but then went and played in the UKDA national championships won the men's singles title as well and looking at dark connect through some good darts in that as well so he's still playing well and he's been playing well this year it's just a case of how often we've been seeing him in these events but if he turns up i think he's going to make the semi-finals and we've got a, a belgian we've got a dutchman we've got a welshman let's go over a canadian as well for that last spot i'm going to go with matt campbell feels like he's one of the next players to have that breakthrough maybe get to a a world Grand Prix or a world match play in the next few years. He's in that top 64 now. He's going to have that tour card again next year. So he, he's making those strides. I, I think he's going to be in that semi-final lineup. And who wins it from there? Let's go with Matt Campbell. I think he's going to beat Gian Van Veen in the final. And I've got to say, I, I would be interested to see that tournament play out. 96 players, probably be a few buys in there, players that won't turn up. But I'd um, yeah, I'd definitely like to see that tournament play out and see who gets the uh, the most predictions right on who makes the semi-finals. So how many do you think I uh, have that you had? I'm, I'm going to say three out of four. 
You were almost right. I originally had Jim Williams on my list, but I decided oh. I decided to change it, so I end up only with two. Um, I do have okay. Mike Decker and uh, Jean Van Veen. I mean, I, I don't. I think I, my reasoning for Jean Van Veen has already been discussed in the previous question. Mike De Decker, same reason that you had. Uh, beyond that, he does have of non torque sorry of tour card holders um, that are not in the top thirty two. Um, he has the second highest average in players championships this year behind only uh, Jim Williams. Uh, but the other two I have, one of whom has been struggling, but I just think is do a good performance at some point, And another one who just keeps having good performances and not getting results. I'll start with the one who's been struggling. Uh, Ryan Meikle, uh, like at the end of last year, it looked like he was, you know, ready for his breakthrough. At the beginning of this year was playing some really good darts, but has really struggled to win a match recently, did finally uh, win, uh, beat George Killington um, in the most recent Players' Championship event in a match that George Killington averaged 104. Uh, but beyond that, he's lost. He had lost first round the previous five events. But I think he's just been going through a bit of a dry patch. I think taking the top uh, 32 out of it, uh, most of his losses have been to top 32 players, Chizzy, Schindler, uh, Damon Hedda. Steve Beaton's not a top 32 player, but it's in an event that's limited to 32 players. Uh, Ratajski and Andrew Gilding among his losses this year. I think just being in a tournament outside that might get him, give him that ability to get back to where he was, which was one of the best players outside the top 32 at the end of last year. And the other one I have is uh, Boris Kersmar, another player who I'm picking for the similar reason that not having the top 32, I think, will just open the draw for him. I mean, he's a player that I don't know why he hasn't had his breakthrough yet, but he's also a player that gets a lot of tough draws because he's not in the top 32. I think just getting into a tournament where he is one of the best players and highest ranked players will help him. And he's a player that I think is finally starting to get it together. Obviously, had a quarterfinal recently before going out to Josh Rock um, about a month ago. Um, So those are the ones I'm going to go with. So two of the four you did. One real dark horse on current form, but a player who I think will bounce back and a player who I think at the beginning of the year, I said, will win his first title this year, still hasn't. And I'm going to keep saying he'll win a title this year until he finally does. Anything else for this week? Well, as always, got to say a big thank you to our guests for joining us, to Peter, to Mike for their time. Big thank you to our sponsor, Dark Wolf. If you want more Dynamite Darts content, head on over to DartWolf.tv. Give Dark Wolf a follow at DartWolf180. Thanks to everyone for listening. We've got our World Match Play preview. That's going to be coming up next week. Looking forward to that. Of course, this weekend, we've got the World Series in Poland. So excited for the Polish listeners that we've got. They're going to get that first big event from the PDC this weekend. Uh, Looking forward to catching a little bit of that. And we'll be talking about that next week. We'll be talking about the World Match Play. And as always say, if you're doing anything involved with the darts, there's only one thing you've got to do, and that is... Enjoy the darts. Well, it's still a little time till you can enjoy the darts. So I think I think what you mean to say is you have to hang tight for now. But yeah, it's, uh, it was good to have you back this week. We'll both be back hopefully next week, assuming your Wi-Fi keeps working. Maybe, uh, you know, my Wi-Fi was out for a day and a half at the end of last week. I wonder if that had something to do with them setting up yours. So who knows? Maybe my if my Wi-Fi is out again. Maybe I won't be back next week, but hopefully I am uh, because we have a lot to talk about as we get ready for the world match play. Some players championship events as well before that. Let us know what who you want on. Let us know if there's anything you want to talk about. Keep getting us the listener questions, whether they're serious or the joke ones that some of you like to send. They're sometimes fun to discuss regardless. Hang tight for now because the letting loose time for the world match play is just around the corner. <laughs>